My name is Dr. Mitchell Joachim. I'm a professor at Columbia University and Parsons, the New School for Design. I'm co-founder of the nonprofit philanthropic organization Terraform One here in Brooklyn, New York. One of the many projects we're working on at Terraform, Terraform One, is to uh, rethink New York City, to look at New York City as if it was 100% self-sufficient. New York City with no inputs or outputs. Imagine this place where the only thing that would come and go would be something like culture. But waste, water, energy, food would all be produced inside the confines of New York City proper with inside its geopolitical boundaries. So what would the reification of this city look like? Can you imagine a future where everything that needs to happen in New York City, especially when it relates to its sufficiency, uh, happens in its own boundaries? So we'd be producing food here in New York City in something like a vertical farm, which is a project that my colleague at Columbia, Dixon Despamier, uh, often promotes. So we would change the landscape, for instance, of um, Central Park to have some of these uh, vertical farms, which are towers that contain lots of food, dwarf wheat, dwarf corn, that could feed 30,000 to 80,000 people per tower. We also look at New York City being self-sufficient when it comes to energy. If we were to for instance, fill up all of Staten Island and about 18% of the surface area of Brooklyn with solar panels, we would power New York City just like a solar calculator. We would need no other power sources. All of those photovoltaics with storage and batteries running at around 20 to 23% efficiency and costing $46 billion adjusted for 2007 would power New York from the sun. Uh, of course, this is not exactly what we're proposing. There's a, around 3,000 acres of unshaded roof space in the city of New York City. So instead of covering Brooklyn and all of Staten Island with, with solar panels, we propose putting them on rooftops and logically integrating them with other kinds of renewable sources to produce energy, newer technologies such as, or renewable technologies such as wind turbines or uh, wave harvesting, etc. Uh, the, the idea here is to think about New York at, at, in, in a kind of provocative like design or urban design statement. Not that Mayor Bloomberg's plan isn't good. Uh, um, his, his plan is, is fairly green. A lot of his principles are hard to argue with. Everyone in New York, for instance, needs to be ten minute, a 10 minute walk uh, from a park. That is something that he plans on doing with Plan NYC. Um, we're, we're thinking of an approach that is much more provocative. That's, that's a grander solution to the largest problem we've encountered. That is this global problem of uh, climate change. So we, we want to propose uh, larger answers that meet uh, this criteria of a solution that just spans all sorts of issues. So having a prototype city like New York being completely self-sufficient, especially when it comes to its energy, waste, uh, food, etc., cetera, uh, would be a, a salient example so that others can get the idea of, uh, of how to do it and do it right and do it green. Well, when we're thinking about making New York City completely self-sufficient, it's really a theoretical proposition. Uh, the, the actual changing of a city takes an incredible amount of time. Uh, for instance, if you think of telecommunications um, technology, the cell phone takes about um, five to seven years before everyone starts to buy into this new technology. Landlines were replaced with cell phones in about five to seven years. The technology ramped it up really quick and leapfrogged the prior technology because it wasn't as good. Uh, vehicle design, car design, takes about 15 to 20 years before we see a paradigm shift in vehicles themselves, in, the, in those objects. Uh, the scales of economy are a, lar a lot larger than telecommunications. So, uh, of course, the time it takes to get everyone buying these new kinds of vehicles takes a bit longer. Um, architectural technologies takes even longer than cars. That's about at least uh, 40 years before you see a, a massive shift in building technology that's ubiquitous in every city. The reason for that is when a landlord or a building owner purchases or creates a building, they expect the roof to last 20 years. They expect the windows to last 20, 40 years. They don't expect the building to fall down right away. So they're, they're not inclined to create or purchase a new technology, even green ones, right off the bat, right away. So buildings will take... Uh, a, a much longer time. And, you know, the city as a project takes the longest time to change. So we think of telecommunications to automobiles to buildings 
and finally to the city, the larger scale, it takes about 100 to 150 years to see these kinds of uh, effects uh, 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 fully implemented in cities. So this project uh, about thinking uh, of a self-sufficient Manhattan is, is a, is a hundred-year thought. It's actually a polemic in kind of a greater primordial soup of polemics so that others on the table can input their ideas and we can have a, a, a very long-lasting discussion about the implications of having a truly and provocatively green and sustainable New York. How can architecture be humanitarian? Well, we started off uh, with kind of the same question. Is, uh, Terraform One is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization, uh, meaning that we're, we're not interested in private clients. We're not interested in developers or developer interests. We're not interested necessarily in direct corporate relationships. Uh, we, we, we have clients that uh, don't necessarily speak for themselves like communities that can't afford elite architects, planners, and urban designers, or uh, elements of the environment that have absolutely no voice, uh, things like uh, water, trees, air, etc. So we, we, our projects that we work on are uh, privilege these individuals and these elements so that we create uh, environments that are, are actually fitted into the metabolism of the local ecosystem and are fitted to the communities at large to provide a choice so that if you're confronting a plan, let's say you're a community in Harlem uh, and you have to confront Columbia University's expansion into Harlem, uh, you don't actually have a choice. It's not easy for you to go out and redraw their designs, to rethink their plans. You've got a lot of other things on your mind. But if you're given a choice, provided from a nonprofit agency, a nonprofit group like ourselves, and you could see the difference between their plan and our plan, you could start pointing out things that you like, pointing out desire lines or, or, or uh, approaches that are more amiable to uh, the, your community's happiness. And you can make that argument and you can make it visually with drawings that, that will provide. So we, we often take unsolicited projects, uh, sometimes unfeasible projects, and, and go for it. And we publish them in every possible venue and create uh, uh, what we think is a healthy dialogue. It's, it's very activist-like, so in that sense it is similar to humanitarian aid. We're going out there and we're performing acts of architecture and urban planning uh, for what we believe is uh, for the greater good. Uh, but, you know, admittingly we're a bit selfish. Uh, we get our jollies from doing this stuff. We just love design and we're not interested in being constrained, constrained by uh, folks like, I don't know, Donald Trump who have their own kind of vision and need to, uh, you know, get a return on equity. Uh, and that's not something that, that uh, floats our boat. If you think about the future of suburbia, there is no future. Sprawl is a kind of a failed pattern. So we don't want to throw good money after bad. We want to rethink the future of America's infrastructure alongside its existing arteries of mobility, existing highways, for instance. Alongside the interstates, uh, there is ample opportunity to fit out these interstates with uh, new types of renewable technologies, things like geothermal, algae, energy systems, uh, solar-based systems, and certainly uh, wind turbine systems, etc. Uh, if we were to move along those existing arteries, we could uh, easily retool our infrastructure, make it smarter and renewable. And one of the things is that we, in our opinion at Terraform, we don't actually want the suburbs to continue. We'd rather see them just rot or kind of return to nature. And a few of those elements maybe could be preserved in some fashion and become mobile. America has always been a country on wheels. So one of our propositions, uh, and it's forcibly out there and awfully provocative, uh, is to pick up some of those suburbs, some of those houses in the suburbs, put them on some kind of a movement device, anything possible, doesn't matter, a tractor, a low bed, a combine, and place it alongside America's highways, which would be expanded, getting slightly larger, and you would dwell on the fly. Every day you'd be moving in kind of like a, a new kind of trailer park, I guess, between city core to city core. You could stay in one place alongside these highways and stay there for six months when the weather's nice, and then go to Florida if it gets too cold. And you move at 13 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour, but you move very slowly. But you never have to be permanently in one location. And the idea here is that you're right next to
this smart infrastructure. You're right next to this food production zone, this energy production zone, and your refuse zone. So the suburbs actually become a line, a kind of a linear city that attaches itself to, you know, like two ends of a barbell to these uh, 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 city centers that already exist. So that's our reconception of the suburbs, is put America on wheels and connect them to a, a smart and renewable grid. The term sustainability, uh, I, I have a slight issue with, and there are many others that have a similar issue with that term. Uh, Richard Pluntz at Columbia often says, if you ask 10 scientists, 10 scientists what sustainability means, you'll get 10 separate and different answers. Uh, Bill McDonough also doesn't like the term sustainability. Uh, he thinks it's, uh, it's, it's not provocative enough. It doesn't, it, it's a little bit too status quo. Uh, when I think of sustainability, I think of uh, baseball, but not really good baseball. I think of a team like the Chicago Cubs, a team that is sustaining itself, a team that can play, you know, uh, at, in the major leagues, uh, but it doesn't really win any games, it doesn't win so much, doesn't evolve, doesn't change, doesn't have too many heroes, it's not a breathing, growing, constantly nurturing, beautiful organism. Uh, it's just kind of a group that gets by. It gets by to the next game and the next game and the next game and it's, it's not enough. I mean, if you think of the New York Yankees, that's a team that is evolving, growing, powerful, nurturing, intelligent, uh, filled with heroes. It's a, a kind of a winning, a strikingly winning team. And, 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 th and you would never associate the New York Yankees with being a sustainable baseball team. So I, I would think that if we're gonna call a movement sustainability, it's, 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 a, it's a little too dry. So I, I think uh, the choice that I would often use is uh, socio-ecological. Um, and, and yes, it's a mouthful, but it, I think it describes the problem in, in two major sectors. One, it's about social justice and the policies associated with it. And two, it's about ecological science. Because if these are big problems that we're trying to answer, we need to look to some specific sets of science that could help us solve them. And, and I don't think a term like sustainability uh, does that so well. It's more of a philosophy as well as a science, as well as a kind of attitude. And it's really an umbrella for too much. While ecology is a very specific science that looks at areas in the landscape, looks at flora and fauna, and makes, makes decisions or, or, or has some serious research and, and, and proposals and suppositions that, that are, are much clearer answers. And socio-ecological, the terms mixed together, uh, allows you to accept the fact that it, it, science is never going to be the answer. Science is not a silver bullet. That you'll, you'll need human activity and a, the kind of a culture associated with how we live on this earth and, and the governments that work with us uh, to accept that change is going to happen. Uh, but it's going to happen through, through, through many different characters and actors and agents working together. And so socio-ecological socio design would describe the field that uh, I, I, I work in. I've been called a futurist by many folks out there. Um, I'm comfortable with the label. Uh, I, I think that as an architect and an urban designer, it's our job to be clairvoyant. It's our job to propose something that doesn't exist. Uh, it's the amount of time or the scale of time uh, that that proposal uh, uh, situates itself in that maybe makes me a futurist more than just an architect. Is the work we're doing impractical? Well, I, I would say no, because it's based on uh, current problems. It's based on real world, everyday issues. They're big issues. And I think because they're big issues, there's, there's a kind of fear about making big moves or gestures to, to solve them. And so when, when I hear that our work is impractical, I, I often paraphr paraphrase John F. Kennedy. And he said, if man created problems, man can solve them. So if this problem is really big, uh, you know, our energy crisis, uh, climate change, etc., we are going to need solutions that match that scale. So I, I don't think that we're being impractical. I just think we're, we're, we're putting as many ideas out there as we can and, and concepts that are hopefully grounded in off-the-shelf technologies or proven thoughts from uh, uh, some time ago uh, that, could, that, could, that could make this change happen. I mean, if I was to talk about a practical answer to dealing with our energy crisis in the United States, I would agree with the Obama administration. 
I would say every American should just change the light bulbs and weatherize some buildings. If we started weatherizing buildings for heating or cooling, you know, very cheap to do uh, with you know, weather strips, etc., uh, rubber strips, uh, or you know, changing light bulbs to compact, compact fluorescence, despite the issues of, uh, of mercury, which isn't exactly right, uh, we would save 40% of the energy in the United States. This doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. This we have known for about uh, 30 years, uh, give or take. Uh, uh, they're, they're, the signal of this intention has been communicated by uh, our government, by our scientists, by our designers, by the everyday person. We have long since understood that uh, solving uh, problems with uh, the way we live today when it comes to the environment is actually pretty easy to do. So the average American, Homer Simpson, hasn't invested in these compact fluorescent light bulbs. Not really interested so far. So I think right now we've got about a five-year limit to get on board uh, with this plan. Otherwise, you know, I, there, there'll be some penalties. Uh, I wouldn't be so concerned with the governmental penalties as I would the, the penalties that the Earth will return to us. Well, at MIT, part of my, my dissertation was to rethink uh, automobiles. Uh, in fact, we were charged with making a car of the future. We thought that was a bit boring, and we knew that in about five years it would be a, a really anachronistic object. Uh, every car of the future it becomes really dull as time goes by. So in, instead, we thought of thinking of many discrete inventions that would fit into vehicles in the future, that would rethink mobility in the future through many concepts or kind of lexicon of ideas. If you think of the airbag, which was also invented at MIT. The airbag doesn't belong to any one company or any one model of vehicle. It goes in every kind of car. So we wanted to look at technologies that would fit into every kind of car that wouldn't necessarily belong to every kind of company or a a a any, any company. So one umbrella thought was uh, changing the bodies of vehicles into soft materials, materials that were more social, materials that were scuffable, self-healing, uh, and, and more about pleasured motion and spaces of event instead of what we have today, which is shiny, metal, precious boxes that say, don't touch me when I'm in one, don't look at me, these things get really hot, and I'm stuck in traffic, and there you go. Uh, we were thinking that in the future, when we have about 2.4 billion people on this earth coming in about 30 years, cities are going to be awfully congested. So we want to think of a gentle congestion vehicles where people can move in dense packs or herds or flocks of smart vehicles linked to an intelligent network where the body of the car uh, accepts occasional bumping, accepts an occasional, you know, chow, how you doing? Uh, I'm in a, a Nerf-like automobile. So uh, th these, are, these are concepts that you would be fired uh, as uh, if you were an engineer at General Motors and produce something like this. But they, they came, the soft car came from the principal that no one will ever die in a car accident again. So let's rethink everything we can think about the car to make sure that there, no one could possibly get hurt in them. So that meant we had to slow them down. That meant we had to certainly change their materials. That meant we had to think of many layers of safety, from brakes that uh, replace the contact patch with the actual belly of the car, to thinking of, of uh, the streets themselves in constant communication with the vehicles and the wheels and the cars behind them. So we, we rethought the entire system based on this principle of not only will it be good for the environment, but uh, no one will ever die in a car accident again. And that's kind of how the soft car reified itself. That's how it came about. There's a project uh, called the Fab Treehab, which is thinking about a home that fits itself into every aspect of our local ecosystems, that becomes a part of the ecosystem's metabolism. It's not a compromise, it's actually uh, a dwelling that is holistically considering the landscape. Uh, we decided, well, what, what does that mean? And we looked to a technology that's been around for 2,500 years, and it's called pleaching. And pleaching is a gardening technique where you graft pieces of inosculate matter, pieces of woody plants together, to form one vascular system. So you graft essentially trees or woody plants together to form one tree. Um, and we decided, well, that, that's fantastic. Can we control that computationally? And we could. So in the computer, we produced a geometry, a geometry that would predict where we wanted our trees and woody plants to grow. We made some scaffolds from that geometry, 
and then weaved plants, woody plants, and, and trees into those scaffolds and trained them, maybe almost torture them, into a specific direction, a very specific direction, so that they can triangulate their structures and be self-stabilizing and still be healthy. So that led to this project called the Fab Tree App, which is a house made out of entirely living uh, organisms, living trees. And what's great about a, a, a concept like this is you can build, or I should say grow, uh, one million of these homes on the planet Earth with not a zero consequence, right? not an efficient kind of consequence, but a positive contribution to our environment. Right? So these things are actually fitting into our Earth. They're absorbing carbon. They're a part of the world as we know it. And it's, it's, there, there, there's no, 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 well, no compromise. So we were, we were looking at a, a, a very uh, active and provocative solution to our housing crisis. And it's very difficult to grow one of these things. There's a lot of folks, um, or there's a lot of things in our current system that, find it, uh, hard to, hard, that we find it hard to change. Um, insurance companies are not interested in, in, in bonding a contractor who assembles one of these homes. Banks find it very difficult to give loans for these homes. Uh, they question the resale, etc. Uh, clients are, are pretty worried about insects, which is actually not a problem. A simple modicum of maintenance, just like your normal house, uh, would keep pests away. Uh, their they're planning boards uh, have problems with these homes because they're really trees, not homes. So you can't set zoning heights on these homes. Uh, trees will continuously grow larger. But uh, we're, we're wrestling with these issues every day. The bottom line is that the technology is there. It's feasible. We contributed one new component to it, which is controlling the growth of trees through scaffolds that we make and controlling them into a geometry that provides uh, homes. And it looks like something out of a, you know, a, a J.R. Token book or Lord of the Rings. And, and we know that. And, at least as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with elves. The Obama administration is, is putting a, uh, has put in charge a, a, a director that is an architect, or I guess formerly an architect. And is it a good idea to put architects in politics? Um, I, I think so. I think they're certainly trained to be jacks of all trades. They can handle multiple problems, multi multitask, and, and, and think in, in, in many scales. I'm not really familiar uh, directly with this individual personally that Obama's put in charge for uh, HUD. Uh, I, I think that our, you know, if you look at our past administration's successes, or I should say failures, uh, it's, it's been it's been uh, pretty miserable. I mean, uh, the the issue in New Orleans, and how in I don't know how many years it's been that we've failed to make some kind of contribution to the people in New Orleans. Uh, kind of return them to a state of, uh, of, of conviviality and, and lifestyle that they were used to, or even just house these folks, uh, is, is appalling. Um, I, I think putting an architect in charge of the problems, uh, especially one with uh, urban design skills, would, would be almost a fantasy. And I'm glad the Obama administration is, is looking towards uh, uh, some architects to think about this. Uh, I, I wish we could make it happen even faster. I'm surprised that something like the Beijing Olympics seemingly happened overnight, just a few years. They went from zero to a thousand and impressed the world with a grand, munificent display of architecture and, and culture. And yet America can't really solve its, its housing crises. So uh, architects have been, and that's all across the globe, have been working on this problem for a good century. And I don't think we still have the right answer. But uh, to keep us off the front lines, like many uh, uh, of past administrations, I, I think was a, the wrong answer. If I was to see Barack in an elevator someplace in D.C., um, I think that uh, the advice I would give him is to put more folks like architects in charge of, of, of some major problems that are out there. Uh, I think that we can actually uh, reify them, visually show what those solutions might be in many different camps. I certainly wouldn't put us in charge of the military, but I think we can uh, help retool uh, Detroit a lot better than the folks there. Uh, uh, and I, I think that we're, we're fitted to accept that. There was a talk before, the, you know, before this happened um, between 
the McCain camp and the Obama camp about what they should be promoting uh, in, their, in their elections. And there, I guess, the big issue was uh, Detroit and thinking about what we can do to save Detroit. And I had two separate answers for that. I think for the McCain camp, it would be the military can save Detroit. And there's some serious reasons why. And for the Obama camp, there's going to be you know, science and innovation, maybe, and put some big thinkers in architecture involved in, in retooling Detroit. But for the McCain camp, if you think about it, getting to an all-electric infrastructure, an all-electric mobile infrastructure, would take something like the military to do it. Because DARPA and those folks in the military could make a decision like that. And that decision would be, let's make tanks run on electric drives. Let's make Jeeps run on electric drives. And let's do that because those engines uh, have almost no moving parts, so they're very easy to fix. Uh, they make no sound, and I think military folks like stealth. It's a pretty good thing. Uh, they're a switchable fabric. In other words, the component can be taken out of the tank and put into the Jeep very easily, come out of the Jeep and put it into a helicopter. Um, uh, and they're hard to knock out. Uh, batteries could be laced inside uh, all of these vehicles, helicopters, jeeps, tanks, so that if you hit a certain part of that uh, tank and knock out a section of the battery power, all of the power isn't destroyed. It's distributed throughout the vehicle. So it actually makes a more robust uh, uh, tank. Plus, with electric systems, uh, it goes from zero to 100 instantly. There's no throttling that you would find in, in uh, gasoline-powered systems or diesel-powered systems. So there's a lot of reasons to use uh, electric drivetrains in all of our military vehicles. And I, it's the biggest one is because we want to wean ourselves off of oil. Uh, we probably can source that electricity through a heavy amount of investment in renewables. But then we'd have a military that's completely independent and incredibly powerful. And once the military can do that, it certainly can show Detroit uh, uh, the trail can give them the direction.